Hello and welcome back to the Polaris Travel Health Podcast. Thanks for tuning in with us this week. Today, Jaden and I will be discussing uh, the details of a trip to Southeast Asia. Yeah, I think this is a, a pretty common trip to make, especially among young people looking to travel. I actually have a few friends that are headed out there in about a month. Uh, so I think that this is a good one to discuss. So first off, what countries do you kind of see as being the most common to travel to in this region? And could you kind of give us a rundown of perhaps like a hypothetical itinerary that some people might follow? Okay, well, I think, you know, I've seen many, many of these trips over the years. And, and you know, I don't want to... I always j- sort of joke around with people when they come in and I say like, they'll tell me where they're going and I'll say, well, that's kind of like sort of the usual type itinerary I expect. And I usually say like, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to suggest it's boring, but it's, there's sort of a, a general pattern of what people do. Most of the time I find people usually start off, they they fly into Bangkok, into Thailand most of the time. And then, you know, they'll spend time in in, in Thailand, in Bangkok, and a lot of times go up to Chiang Mai in the northern part of, of Thailand. And there's some ecotourism and elephant stuff and that sort of thing. And then we see people go down further south down to like Phuket and, and some of the islands down there for some beach time and some fun time. And, and then a lot of times you'll see people you know, uh, catch a quick flight over to Cambodia and go into uh, Angkor Wat and check that out. And also very common other place where people will go to is Vietnam. And usually, you know, they'll go to Ho Chi Minh City and might fly up to Hanoi and go check out Ha Long Bay. And sometimes they'll work their way down the coast. And that's a pretty common thing. Also see people go into Laos. Laos is probably out of, you know, it's, there are some things to do there as well. And, um, you know, going through to the capital and there's a few things not too far from the capital. So that is sometimes an add on out of all those countries. I'd say it's probably the fourth of those. But we we certainly if you've got time, we see people going there. And then sometimes you'll see people going to Bali, either, you know, tacking on a week at the beginning or the end or something just to spend have some beach time and some fun time in Bali. But probably a lot of this is is dependent on how much time you have but i'd say that probably the main go to countries is is usually thailand and then vietnam cambodia are are probably the the key core ones cool cool and so what are the covid restrictions looking like right now in those countries well you know uh, they they change all the time but i know jaden you did the research here and you you got the updates so um i think it's pretty safe to assume that all these countries they want proof of vaccination. Some of the restrictions that you meant that you would uh, track down were for Thailand, you you have to have a booking in a hotel for five days, medical insurance, and be vaccinated. Vietnam, you need a, a travel certificate and a negative PCR test. Cambodia, you need a negative PCR test and be vaccinated. Wow, vaccine within the last. 14 days, do a PCR test when you arrive. And then it talks about quarantine for 48 hours and have wearable monitoring for seven days after. So it's, it's a little bit of a, that place is probably one of the harder ones to get into. I think that would, that would sort of be a, I think a a bit of a factor right now in regards to how likely you'd want to end up going there. Yeah, that one seemed to be the most, most restrictive one that I came across was that they, they wanted you to sort of wear a, a monitor for the next week after you'd gotten this uh, gotten tested. So I thought that was a bit interesting, though. I know that in some of the Middle Eastern countries, like I think it was Qatar or maybe it was in Dubai, there was they were doing tracking like that earlier on in the pandemic for everybody. I think everybody, but I, I I talked to people who were I think it was in Dubai, and basically you didn't have a wearable thing, but your phone had to have this app on it, and you had to basically share your location with the government. Cool. Uh, yeah, not sure about that, but yeah, not, not (laughs) cool. Actually, the, the, the the sarcasm just didn't quite come through maybe, but yeah, yeah, cool cool. brackets, sarcasm about that one. That's not great. Okay. Well, say somebody comes into the clinic with this kind of hypothetical itinerary that you laid out, what recommendations are you making to sort of like most travelers in terms of vaccines and sort of just like travel health in general? Well, it's going to depend on a bunch of things like the locations and the activities, of course, but but I think there probably are a couple things that I would really want to highlight. And from a vaccine standpoint, hepatitis A and typhoid really are the go-tos. Those are recommended for pretty much all travelers and they're not part of your usual kid shots. So if you have a you know, a 20 something going to doing this trip, those wouldn't have been part of their their vaccine schedule growing up or anything. Hepatitis B would be one I'd also want to look at. 
Uh, there's certainly risks, you know, in Vietnam, but like in all these countries, I'd say there's some level of risk. But since hepatitis B is blood, body fluid contact, you know, you'd like to think that your risk is lower. And then the other thing is that hepatitis B is part of the normal childhood vaccine program in, in I think, every province in Canada, for example. So, so that would be something you would look at, but typically people will already have it done and you don't need, if you have the series done, you don't need any boosters. So we probably would just leave it at that. And I think the other thing I'd be most concerned about from a non-vaccine standpoint, you know, would be traveler's diarrhea risk and, and a plan to sort of manage that from a prevention and or a treatment standpoint. Right. Okay. So what about some other stuff like the mosquito situation? Obviously, first of all, there's some kind of potential malaria transmission in the region. Who and like kind of when would you recommend anti-malarial drugs? So with malaria for these areas, generally speaking, if you are sticking to the typical tourist itinerary, malaria risk is not high. Like when you look at a map, for example, of, of Thailand and where the malaria risk is, it really are in areas that tourists never go to. Places on the the eastern side of the of the country where there's really no tourist attractions to speak of, and also you know some other parts along the border with Myanmar, Burma on the, the western edge. Now, typically speaking, these are not places tourists go. Now, I would say that if you're going to do volunteer work, you're going to visit family, and maybe you could end up in some of these more remote locations. But you know the usual Bangkok. Chiang Mai, Phuket type areas, not really a big concern. And then when you start thinking about Vietnam, it's kind of similar in the sense that all of the risk areas are more inland. And if you're doing sort of sticking along the coast and you're staying in that sort of Hanoi, Hue, Da Nang, Ho Chi Minh, all those areas all sort of along the coast, the risk is pretty negligible. Uh, again, if you were going inland and you were going into some uh, villages to do, again, volunteer work or visiting family, that'd be different. Cambodia is probably the one place where sometimes it can come up. Uh, Phnom Penh, where is you'd fly into the capital, is, there's no real malaria risk there. And then the Angkor Wat area. So basically, Angkor Wat is in a malaria area, but this is usually how we tend to approach it. When, when you're staying in that area, you're doing Angkor Wat you're not being there during dusk and dawn hours. That's the times when the mosquito, malaria mosquitoes are most active. So if you're going in and you're doing a day trip in to see Angkor Wat, the malaria mosquitoes are not really out and about too much. So I would say right now that like when we're doing re recommendations for Cambodia and you're going to Angkor Wat, we usually don't prescribe anti-malarials because the risky area you're going to be in is you're not there at the right time of day. If you were in theory camping in Angkor Wat, that might be a different thing, but but nobody does that. So uh, as far as other parts of Cambodia, yeah, like if you are, if you have time, this would be something, Jaden, I'd actually like to do. If you want to get off the beaten path and you want to go try something totally rough around the edges and different, if you go to the coast area of Cambodia, it is, we've certainly had patients come in who have been going to this part of the world, but it would be sort of a real kind of rough around the edges beach trip. There's some lovely beaches there, but it's really not developed. But some of those areas are high risk malaria areas. So I have prescribed anti-malarials for those areas and also doing other volunteer work in other parts of the, of the country. Yeah. Malaria risk is there too. Oh, and yeah, I've been talking for a long time. I'll just finish up with Lao. <laughs> um, sure. Lao is um, the capital, usually not a risk. And some of the real touristy areas are not as much of a risk either, but pretty much the rest of the whole country is. Okay, cool. Uh, <sighs> how about... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of talking. Yes, but I, I think it was necessary because I think there is like, you know, when you when you look at the, the maps, it can be a little bit confusing as to like what, who would need what and when. So I think that you, you laid that out pretty well. But the next thing that I would kind of be concerned about after malaria would be things like uh, dengue, Zika, and then perhaps even like Japanese encephalitis as well. Yeah. Well, if you're going to get a mosquito illness in this part of the world, 
probably going to be dengue. Den- it would be dengue. Oh yeah, for sure. Because dengue is a daytime biting mosquito and, and dengue does well in urban areas. Yeah, you can get dengue in downtown Bangkok. You can get dengue, Vietnam, all these places. Basically everywhere we listed, dengue is a significant risk. So right. like I said, if, you, if you're going to get anything, it's going to be dengue. And then you bug spray precautions. Zika, well, you know, it's theoretically there, I guess. I wouldn't do anything different. Like, you know, it's the same kind of mosquito that carries... It's the same kind of mosquito that carries dengue. So from that standpoint, do all the bug spray and and bite protection precautions you do. And I can't really do much more than that. I I really wouldn't, you know, again, Zika is far more concerning in anyone who's pregnant. I don't think I would necessarily tell someone who's pregnant, don't go to Thailand because of Zika. Not at this point in time with the information we have, that could always be subject to change. Uh, as, As far as, you know, other things like Japanese encephalitis, depending on the season, it could be a concern, you know, obviously in summer, rainier seasons. And if you're going more off the beaten path and you're going more into the jungle, like more of the agricultural areas, the non-touristy areas, your risk would be a lot higher. But, you know, getting Japanese encephalitis in sort of the urban touristy areas, the risk is not zero, but it's low. It is, it, you know, it happens, but the odds are pretty strongly against it. All right. Well, good to know. What about some other kind of like potential health concerns? You know, I think when you start thinking about other things, like, you know, there's always going to be concerns with marine hazards. If, you know, most of the time when people are going this part of the world, the ocean and the beach is is a big draw. So, so there's always those kinds of things, you know, when you start thinking about, you know, your usual jellyfish and sea urchins and corals and stonefish and stuff. And, and I think another thing that is obviously a concern is monkey, monkey bites, dog bites, definitely a risk. You know, there's no, no shortage of uh, monkeys around in this part of the world. And there, we have certainly seen people who have gotten bit by, by monkeys on, on, on these kinds of itineraries. Air pollution, yeah, you're, these, some of these countries, the pollution is not great. And if you're doing adventurous type activities, you know, leptospirosis in fresh water is certainly a thing. Refer back to our previous leptospirosis episode. Not sure what number it is, but look back in our, our archives and you could find us talking more about leptospirosis. Yes, that was that was a little while ago, but definitely check that one out if you're if you're thinking about it. Okay, if you were to get sick with any, you know, something happens unfortunately on your trip and you need medical attention, what type of access do you have in each of these areas? Generally speaking, if you are in sort of some of the tourist areas, you can sort of count on the fact that there will be clinics that t- uh, cater to expats and tourists. You know, I, I know, you know, going back like you know many years ago to when I was in Vietnam, like I remember in Ho Chi Minh city, like driving right past it. And there was this medical clinic and it was in big English letters, you know, international medical clinic. And I would presume that if something happened to you, that would be the first place I'd go. There are, you know, accredited hospitals in some of these areas, but you know, you need to make sure you've got travel insurance, but you also need to be uh, travel health insurance, but you know, and you also need to be prepared for the possibility that you may have to pony up a credit card before you get much service. So, you know, when you start thinking about, you know, in Thailand, Bangkok, you know, there's probably access to as good medical care as for a price, you know, you can, you know, you should, you can get probably just about anything you want done there. Again, make sure you've got credit card available. Uh, I would say that um, Laos and Cambodia, your access to medical care and Vietnam is probably a bit better in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh, but Laos and Cambodia, probably not the, you know, ideal situation. You probably would, you know, be looking at, you know, in these locations, getting sent to Bangkok or maybe Singapore by Medivac if something real bad happened to you. But um, I would say that even in, in some of these places, like you should have access to sort of like reasonably basic minor ailment type stuff that, you know, that shouldn't, that should be gettable. Oh, gettable. That's a terrible word. (laughs) (laughs) That should be that should be accessible in some sense. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, what about uh, some kind of like final safety slash security concerns that you might run into in the region? So I think in this part of the world, I think the main thing you always have to keep in mind is no matter how hard you try, Canadian you're not blending in, you know, you're, you just, you know, you're, you're standing out. Now, 
how much does that truly make you a target? You can't blend in. You're going to be noticeable. I think generally speaking in some of these countries, like I know in Vietnam, you know, going back historically when I was there, like I think it's sort of understood in, in these countries that tourists provide a lot of money into the economy and, you know, messing with tourists in a serious fashion could lead to some serious consequences because the government will make an example of somebody who messes with a tourist in like, like a more serious level. But with that being said, I think that, you know, the general assumption of the average public in, in this part of the world is that if you're traveling and you've come halfway around the world just to look around, you must have lots of money. So uh, on that basis, you know, could you get like small little scams and stuff like that being overcharged? I think that's always a concern, you know, like keeping your wits about you and watching your belongings. You know, I think that's you know, I think even in some of these countries, they would just be like, well, they got lots of money. They're not going to if I, if I steal their bag. It's not, you know, it's that moral justification at some level, which, uh, you know, uh, and I think, you know, as far as other things, you know, you want to be careful with alcohol consumption. I would not want to get incredibly drunk and, and not be wandering the streets in some of these places. And the other thing I would want to emphasize too is drug use. You know, here in Canada, you know, the use of, you know, marijuana is, you know, everywhere and legal now and, and use of other drugs, you know, <sighs> I'll put it to you this way. In some of these countries, I would not go there. Like, it's just, you're taking too much of a chance. Like, you, you know, I, they would be far more inclined to clamp down on you if you were some kind of illicit drugs. I think you have a far higher chance of getting yourself in trouble as a tourist, as opposed to a lot of other things. And the other thing I would mention too is, Ah, in a lot of these countries, there are there is the ability to get yourselves in other kinds of trouble in regards to you know just you know prostitution and and other kinds of things. So like I think that you really need to be mindful of some of this stuff, and it's certainly not hard to not hard to access in this part of the world. So I think you just you know you need to be really smart about your choices. Definitely, definitely. And I think that there's, you know, always, always a good idea to keep an eye out for yourself and be remain aware of your surroundings. I mean, there's some areas in each of these countries where there's kind of ongoing political violence as well. And I think it's, it's best to just kind of keep your wits about you and always make sure that you, if you wouldn't do it in front of your grandma, probably better not do it when you're out of the country. Yeah, I think you just like, you know, you got to just sort of keep things in mind. We know that people in general, their risk-taking behavior goes up greatly when they when they travel. But mm -hmm. I just, I you know, and so I'm not gonna be the total killjoy and say don't do anything. <laughs> but you gotta, you gotta maybe you gotta still set that line. And 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 I think that you know, especially you know, you know, when you're with a group of people, you need it's always good to be doing things with you know having a group of other people around you and 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 so that you have a common sense friend that can you, you can kind of view with to a degree or or know that you can be their common sense friend and vice versa in various situations and the other thing i want to mention i know that you you added it into the notes here jaden and i before we move on when it talks about personal safety and stuff really 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 be careful about traffic and vehicle stuff mm -hmm. uh, the number one risk of dying outside of, of canada on a trip is not by getting bit by some mosquito or something like that. It is by getting in some kind of traffic accident. And when you think about it, and I think we might have touched on this in a previous podcast, but, but uh, you know, when you think about it, getting in the back of a cab in a developing country at night is probably one of the most risky things you can do. You know, the driver education is not as good. There are increased, you know, alcohol consumption, the infrastructure, the traffic road infrastructure is not as good. And, and of course, I think the biggest factor is if you get into a car accident, what's going to happen to you? You know, when we think about here in Canada, when you get in a situation where you get into a car accident, there's like an air ambulance that's flying in and 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 going to pluck you up uh, from that accident scene and fly you to a trauma center here where, you know, you're going to get top of the line medical care, world class medical care in minutes. Uh, if you get into an accident in one of these other countries, even if it's in an urban area, how is that ambulance going to get to you? Who's going to call it? When, how quickly is it going to take uh, take them to get there? And when they get there, where are they going to take you to? What's going to be the quality of medical care? That's really probably one of the defining differences between sort of why the rate of 
dying in a car accident is a lot higher there than it is here. Right. Right. Okay. Well, anything else you want to mention, you want to chat about that we didn't kind of touch on that you want to discuss? Not really. I think we've kind of done a pretty good job of, of, of covering most of these things. Uh, you know, I think, you know, one thing I would always mention, and, and we I sort of briefly touched on it was about rabies. Just as a reminder, you know, when we would do a, a consult like this, we would always talk about rabies vaccine. Now, the concern with rabies vaccine is it's incredibly expensive. So mm -hmm. one of the things you'd want to look at is, you know, when you're thinking about doing rabies vaccine, I, I like to look at sort of the factor of if you're getting it for this trip, you may not necessarily need to always think about it from the purposes of this trip. Rabies vaccination usually lasts a long time before you ever need a booster. So sometimes you can amortize that cost over maybe several trips. So if you know, if you're 21 years old and you're planning on traveling a lot in your 20s, uh, maybe you can justify it on that basis, or maybe you're still covered on on uh, the family drug plan, maybe. Uh, but uh, you need to think about that because, you know, I think it, it's your risk is relatively low, but overall, if you get bit, you have to wash the area out with soap and water immediately and seek medical attention. The idea behind doing rabies vaccinations in advance is that your risk, you already have the vaccine on board, the post-exposure regimen of getting a vaccine booster and being followed up with, with healthcare, it's not quite as complicated. You still need to be seen by a doctor. You still probably need to get a booster and be checked for other types of infection, but it's not quite the emergency it is that if you get bit by a monkey and then you got to go see a doctor pretty quick, and then you need to go through a series of, you know, usually about five injections of, of, uh, on very specific days for, for post-exposure prophylaxis. So, you know, you're, you should never die from rabies. It should never happen. But uh, the only way it's going to happen is if you don't get followed up. So I, I think th that's something which always is worth mentioning. And then also when you talk about Japanese encephalitis, you know, we do have a vaccine available for that. But again, very expensive vaccine. So, th you know, that would be one where you would want to look at it and say, you know, what are, what are my risks? You know, the risk is not zero. The risk is low. But, you know, how do you want to approach that? The one thing I sometimes will tell patients is that with Japanese encephalitis, you know, you can use bug spray, but if you happen to get infected, there's nothing we can do for you and you you get symptomatic. So the, the one thing about rabies is that if you do get bit, as long as you know you're going to be followed up, you, you're going to be okay. So maybe that plays into your how you decide, you know, which vaccine you're going to get. Now, what should happen in any travel appointment that you have? This should all be broken down and explained to you and the risks and the benefits and the costs should be explained. And, and I think that's really important. I, I certainly have heard tale of people who have done travel consults or received travel consults as some, some providers and they basically insist that you're going to need to get the Japanese encephalitis vaccine or you're going to die. Now that's that's a little extreme. I think you you need to have somebody that can properly explain to you the risks and the benefits and the costs and then mutually make a decision that works for everybody. Right, right. Yeah, you want somebody who's going to be honest with you and break down the risks effectively for... Yeah, I, I just, I, I find, and, and maybe it's just, you know, the way we roll as healthcare providers and stuff sometimes that, you know, we're erring on the side of caution. But I think that, you know, you just have to keep in mind that there, the risks and the benefits, like, they just have to be, you know, you have to sort of explain that and have it balanced out properly because... You know, like I said, with rabies, your chances of something happening pretty low. If something happens, you can deal with it. If you, when you have to deal with it, it's an enormous pain in the butt, but you can deal with it. So you just need to figure out like how important that is to have that peace of mind and protection and that sort of thing. And like I said, these are all things that if you have a good travel health provider, they they should be able to adequately explain these things to you and not just try and insist that you need to have, get all these vaccines or else. Right, right. That's that's just scare tactics. You don't want that necessarily. Yeah. Okay, well, anything else you want to mention? I think that's it. Do you have anything, Jaden? Is there anything I missed? Is there any uh, locations? Like, uh, we didn't really talk too much about the Bali aspect of things, but I feel like we've talked enough about the other locations. But I think that, was there anything else about any of those other four countries that uh, you felt I, I've, I've missed on? Uh, not particularly. I think I mentioned some of the, like... 
I didn't, we didn't necessarily touch on like the landmine element, but I don't think that that would be like a huge thing for most people. I think that that's like pretty far away from where most people would be hanging out. So I don't I, think it's a huge concern. I agree. Like, I think the thing is, is that when you're approaching a, a appointment like this, there's kind of two types of appointments for, for th these locations. One, doing the kind of itinerary we talked about, or mm -hmm. two, not doing the itinerary <laughs> like so where, true. where you're going into these other areas. Like I've, have I had people who have gone into some of these areas? Yeah. I can remember uh, I had this group and they were going right along the border of Myanmar, Burma and Thailand. And they were going to do volunteer work in some villages right by the border. Well, we had these conversations about malaria and we had these conversations about landmines and being careful to not stray over the border and because if you did it could be very bad for you but yeah. uh you know as long as you're gathering like this would be an example of you know a trip could be very different it can be in the same country but it can be a very different trip based on that so you know if you want to talk about thailand doing the trip that we've focused on as opposed to going to do volunteer work by the by the border as opposed to going to bangkok for a week to do business those are all in the same country, but they're very different. The recommendations would be substantially different for, for each of those. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Well, thank you for tuning into this week's edition of the Polaris Travel Health Podcast. A reminder that the information and advice we provided in this podcast are not a substitute for live medical advice tailored to your itinerary and your medical history. If you have questions or want to book an appointment, please head over to our website, www.polaristravelclinic.ca. Check us out on Twitter at Polaris Travel Rx and our Facebook page as well. We hope you'll tune in again with us next week. Thanks, Shaden. Thank you.